I feel so alone sometimes, you have no idea. And the loneliness seems to seep into my bones and I get scared because I feel numb. Not depressed or upset. I'm a blank tape. Like someone dragged a magnet against the tape inside my brain and erased all the information. There's nothing left to feel. I felt it all and I'll never feel anything new again. And I'll always be alone. Welcome to the Final Girls Podcast, where we watch horror films and read horror books. This is Anna Bogutska, your podcast host. If this is your first time listening, we usually cover horror film history on this main feed and notable new horror releases over on the Patreon, which you can find and support at patreon.com forward slash the final girls. Alongside our film coverage, every month or so, I interview some of the most exciting people who are writing horror right now under the banner Bloody Book Club. We're in between seasons here at the podcast, and also I'm on a holiday, so I'm bringing you bonus Bloody Book Club episodes to tide you over. In this episode, I talk to Silvia Moreno-Garcia, writer, editor, and publisher, as well as author of the best-selling novel Mexican Gothic and the daughter of Dr. Moreau, amongst many others. Her book, Silver Nitrate, follows a talented but overlooked sound editor, Montserrat, who's left out of the boys' club running the film industry in 1990s Mexico City when her best friend, Tristan, a faded soap opera star who she's secretly in love with, discovers that his new neighbor is a cult horror director, they set out on a dark adventure. Because the director claims he can change their lives, with the help of a Nazi occultist imbuing magic into highly volatile silver nitrate stock. If you're into your horror film history, your film formats, and your black magic rituals, Silver Nitrate is for you. In this conversation, we talk about cursed films and taking inspiration from classic horror movies, weaving in Lovecraftian influences, dark magic, and Nazi history into Silver Nitrate. With all of that said, please enjoy my conversation with author Silvia Moreno Garcia. Silvia, thank you so much for giving up a bit of your time to chat to me. Um, I was recommended Silver Nitrate by my editor, actually, as soon as it was announced, uh, because she knew that uh, it was a combination, like a perfect Venn diagram of all of my interests. And I'd heard of your work before, but this was the first entry point into your stories. And I couldn't think of of a better combination. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So to start off, and I and I ask this question of everyone who comes into the podcast that in in one way or another, can you tell me about your personal relationship with horror, be that literary or horror films? Um, I started reading horror when I was quite young and also watching horror movies. So I probably have a uh, read uh, things since I was a child and also watched a lot of movies. So it's a lifelong commitment, I guess. Are there any that kind of spring to mind that were your gateway into the genre? Well, when I was young, the first things that I started to read were Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft and then moved on to sort of Victorian authors of the Gothic. And in terms of horror films, I watched everything when I was quite young from universal horror movies to uh, the kind of stuff that was coming out in the 80s of slasher films and uh, mm-hmm. other kinds of movies. I wanted to to start by talking about Silver Nitrate kind of in particular. Um, I read that the seed of Silver Nitrate, the novel, was a short story that you published over a decade ago. What about that story stuck with you and how it evolved in and how it developed into the novel Uh, yes uh, if people want to read that story it's called a flash frame it's actually on my website if you go to the silver nitrate page there's a kit with material for reading the book it includes some essays and other stuff and it includes that short story 
but um it's it's not the same as silver nitrate if you read mm -hmm. it and then you read silver nitrate you might be like none of the characters in silver nitrate appear in this short story uh none of the magical elements in silver nitrate appear in the short story but thematically it is about film and about i guess the uncanny in that short story the direct parallel would be the king in yellow mm -hmm. and that kind of relationship of a material a film film material that um uh, drives you well not mad but drives you into a land of the of the uncanny where reality seems to be reality and something else begins and so in the king in yellow that relationship is through a written text uh where there's there's a written text that seems to have some kind of noxious effect and in uh in my short story in in flash frame that relationship is with film so with visual with visual media and and that idea of just film and elements of the of the strange of, of the supernatural of the uncanny was that was what remained and what reemerges in the novel in silver nitrate in a very different form so like i said nobody should mm -hmm. think oh it you know it was like a five thousand word short story and it got turned into a novel it was just my thoughts on on film mm -hmm. continued to to exist and eventually i wrote something else that had to do with film tell me then about silver nitrate you know this the the short story very much was the seed and uh your relationship with phil or the idea of kind of this obsession with this uh, object can you tell me a little bit about what came first with silver and nitrate once you actually started working on the novel itself was it was it this obsession was it the the occult um, was it a particular character, perhaps? Uh, my books don't tend to emerge from a single seat, so it's generally mm. a number of things over time that I become interested in. Uh, there's some ideas that are not fully formed until another idea comes to to the mix, basically, mm -hmm. and then they they crystallize. So silver nitrate initially, uh, even though I wrote a short story that was related to film that wasn't the thing that really took root in my mind and kind of helped um usher a novel and mm -hmm. what happened was that eventually i was reading about um occultism in mm -hmm. early 20th century france and there was a footnote in the book that i was reading and the footnote mentioned an occultist called arnold from heller and said that he had gone from Paris to Mexico. And I was interested in that footnote because I'm from, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I went and I looked for information on Arnold Krumheller and I became more interested in him because he had been um, associated with President Francisco I. Madero. And Francisco I. Madero was a, a very important, it's a very important figure in Mexican history. Uh, it's like saying, for Americans that Abraham Lincoln or for mm -hmm. Brits that Queen Victoria mm -hmm. had an occultist friend. I knew about Madero's interest in the kind of supernatural because I had done during my master's degree in science and technology studies, I had been interested in studying early 20th century because of its connections with science technology at the time. Early 20th century Occultism was considered possibly a serious scientific venture. People were going to measure ectoplasm and take spirit photography and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So in that era, ideas of um, specifically of spiritism, of being able to interact with ghosts, with the, with the dead, are taken very seriously and, and are considered pretty progressive in like kind of advanced. We wouldn't think it's kooky like nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so President Madero was interested in this kind of stuff because he was a progressive sort of, sort of chap anyway. So I discovered that he was, in fact, um, knew this journal Crumb Heller and read more about Crumb Heller and read some of his writing. And when I read some of his writing, he had, you know, a, most all of this have a book about, you know, this is how this works. And I um, noted some of the um, kind of white supremacist racist implications in the text. And that 
led me, after reading him, it led me to look for other artists, and especially German occultists, and look for the work that they had been doing. And so I, I, I you know, looked at Helena P. Blavatsky mm-hmm. and her work on esoterism and discovered um, how racism and racism was baked into some of these occult treatises. And Blavatsky is somebody that Jake Spiegel and David Reddles have talked about how her work helped foster anti-Semitism. So it was kind of baked into some of these esoteric works. Then, of course, that led me into Nazi Germany, where there's a really kind of complicated relationship with occultism, because on the one hand, the Nazis ban occultism, occult practice, um, certain kinds of things like tarot reading or astrology are banned, and uh, people are basically sent to concentration camps if they were practicing that. But at the same time, other practices are kind of allowed and investigated by the Nazis. They have things like the hollow earth theory, Mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty out there, you know, about another civilization living in the middle of the earth. At one point, they organized something called Operation Mars, where they take several of those um, sorcerers and astrologers that they have in concentration camps, they take them out of them, and they put them basically to work for them at a villa in Berlin because they're trying to find somebody and they're trying to, you know, use the pendulum swinging to find somebody. And then after the war, there's the Landing Group, which is formed by Wilhelm Landing, and which combines older esoteric practices with New Age notions of Nazi revivalist ideas. And so there was just all this um, kind of the occult and white supremacists and Nazi interacting and strolling together over a long Mm -hmm. period of time. And then to cap it off, I started reading about Hans Heinz Evers, who is the last name of that person, is what is the name of my villain in my novel. And Heinz Heinz Evers, I had read something about him. He was a short story writer, so I had read a short story about him, but I didn't really know that much about him. And so I got into knowing about him. And he wasn't just a novelist and a short story writer. He was a script writer in the early days of cinema, so kind of silent film. He wrote some of that. He was interested in film. Um, He was also a correspondent with um, Aleister Crowley, a very famous occultist. Yeah. And he was also a Nazi sympathizer, among other things. And he lived in Mexico for a time. He was was apparently spying in Mexico in the early 20th century for the Germans before during world war one basically and and so i just thought i couldn't make him up right and i couldn't make up some of the stuff that i was reading it was in the realm of the fantastic but i was just like this guy was real and he existed and he had all these strange connections that i was looking at Mm -hmm. all in one kind of dude and and at that point one of the big elements of of silver nitrate was there, which was the occult angle, but it's not mm-hmm. just the occult angle, it's the occult angle and its connections to white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's also deployed in your book kind of in this really insidious way where at first, you know, the obsession that guides Montserrat is very much um, the obsession of a horror buff, of a movie buff, of trying to figure out this mystery. The, the white supremacy of it all kind of goes becomes revealed as we dig in deeper in who Wilhelm Friedrich Evers, your your villain, really was. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this um this layering of magic and occultism and the this long tale of Nazi eugenics into this one figure who is uh, at the start of the book at least um very much dead so he is we get to know him through the things that he left behind you know his his writings the the myth of him the book kind of elements that help us piece together who he was uh before the the full villainy of him is revealed uh, yeah the only way you experience the past in this novel it's not a dual timeline novel is through basically the research that happens in it. So it functions in a way like um, like an M.R. James ghost story, but 
modernized, obviously, in which you've got a protagonist who is a scholar, scholar or an antiquarian that acquires a, a book or an object that implicates them in the supernatural, that implicates them in some element of the past. And that's, and that's what happens in the book. So we uh, kind of travel to the past or connect with the past through the medium of film, which is the, the object in, in this case. So Emma James would have done it differently. And there's an Emma James quote at the beginning of the book for, for that reason. Mm -hmm. It's basically a play on um, the classic Victorian ghost story. But what I thought I would take from that and do it differently. I've uh, when I was reading kind of other other interviews with you as research, I saw you speak about two classic horror movies, um, The Vampire's Coffin and Inferno. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about these two titles and how they in particular inspired Silver Nitrate and if there was any other films that you uh, discovered in your research or that you already had top of mind when you were writing the book? Um, I mean, the movies are good examples of the things that I like to to look at. The mm -hmm. things that are more of a direct filmic inspiration in terms of film history are, of course, the story of Mexican cinema the, and the fall of Mexican cinema in general. And then there's the work of three directors specifically, Juan Lopez Moctezuma, who's a Mexican director, Carlos Enrique Stavuada, who's a Mexican director, mm -hmm. and finally, Dario Argento, who's an Italian director. And mm -hmm. they three do have elements that are more mm, twist at, were twist at while I was working on this, than, let's say, um, specific movies, more like their careers or their or their life work than, than a specific movie. But in the case of... Um, of Juan Lopez Moctezuma and Carlos Enrique Tabuada. They both direct horror movies in Mexico. They're both very interesting people, and they both have two lost films. So they both have two mysterious films that are lost, that we know were kind of made, mm -hmm. but have not been screened. And so that's one of the direct elements in their filmography that became very interesting to me. And what about the idea of a lost film fascinates you? Um, well, I think that uh, when you look at something like um, El Alimento del Miedo, which is Juan López Moctezuma's lost film, and when you look at um, Carlos Enrique Estabuada's lost last film, Girón de Niebla, and almost any lost film where there's about a director that had some kind of renown, some kind of name or, or cult um, status, uh, stories start to swirl. You start um, in the pre-days of the internet. Nowadays on the internet, you might find people talking about Reddit or forums, but in the pre-days of the internet, you would just, you know, go to, I guess, a blockbuster if you were in the United States or maybe another video store in, if you were in another part of the world. And you would always find that person. And it was usually a guy, um, that, mm -hmm. that guy who just knew everything about film and he Oscar candidate who was for some reason always at the video store. And he would tell you, Well, yeah, man, you know, if you like that, you should, you know, <laughs> know about like that film that uh Lopez Moctezuma made, you know, El Alimento del Miedo. And it's lost, man, but I heard that somebody has a copy of it in a vault in Polanco and they, they keep it there, but it's hidden and only the president has access to it, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes a bit of an urban legend and everybody, and it's, well, it's not everybody, I guess, in this case, it's very specific people because these are not super famous filmmakers, but they have a kind of following, um, mm -hmm. really get into it and they have theories about it. They uh, uh, try to learn as much as they can about it, rumor swirl. In the case of... Um, of uh, something like Giron de Niebla, uh, which was Tabuada's film. It, there was a documentary about it that was actually released this year in 2023. I didn't know it was coming out, but it came out oh, wow. about, you know, that, that lost film. Mm -hmm. And that was actually 
remade a few years ago when they, I think they took the script from the original and they made it um, like in recent times. So that's mm-hmm, how much mm-hmm. it fascinated certain people. And um, and there's the same thing with El Alimento del Miedo in the sense that just people just keep talking about it. And it's just, it's just really curious when you see an object like that. And it can be this films or somebody else's kind of film where you're talking about something that, um, I mean, in the case of some of these movies of El Alimento del Miedo or or Giron de Niebla, there's people talking about them who were not born when they were made, right? Like I was born when they were made, but I was I was quite young. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's people who were not even babies when these films happened, and yet they want they want to know, right? They want mm-hmm. to see, and. There's something about that relationship, about that desire to see and to seek, and also the cult status in in film in certain kinds of art, where only a select group of people have access to that knowledge and kind of interest with that knowledge. And nowadays, it's easier to acquire that knowledge, but in pre-internet days, it was pretty hard. You had to be at the right place at the right time and have access to the right people to know some of these things. In some of these stories, and there was therefore something almost magical or sacred about it, because you were one of the few, one of the chosen few, who happened to know about El Alimento del Miedo, and you were going to carry the word of Juan López Moctezuma someday at some party. You were going to tell somebody about that, and that's I just find that to be um, just a very interesting relationship with art. It is. It's almost um, there. I think film lends itself particularly well to that, particularly if it's a if it's a lost film um, from the pre digital era, because then it exists as a physical object that can that needs a special ki- skill in order to even be viewed. And in the case of your book, there's a lot of emphasis put on the fact that it's nitrate prints, which are notoriously for any um, film nerds listening. It's incredibly flammable um, to the point where not people just cannot. It's not logistically possible to screen them. The skills don't even exist um, anymore in a lot of kind of everyday projectionists. It takes a lot of resource and knowledge to even handle those prints, let alone screen them in public. There was recently uh, uh, an archive film festival here in London, which is the nerdiest sentence that I've said today. And the main selling point was being able to see films on nitrate prints. And and even that experience, the possibility, uh, the danger associated with screening those films was created a certain buzz in the room. And I was I was reading as I was reading your book, I remember thinking in my head about all the films that I've read about that I've never actually been able to see. And the few that I have seen that are not available online or have never been distributed that exist only in someone's private collection or uh, or I've never been released by the filmmaker. It's it's a giddiness that cannot fully be described. Uh, It is essentially like seeing forbidden knowledge. And if you imbue it with um, magical powers, essentially with occult powers and with an actual um, underlining mystery that exists to it, it's, it's a way of really kind of making making tangible the the impossible magic of seeing a film that is somehow lost or forbidden. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen things that will never be seen again. <laughs> um, and you can think about this from something as popular as Star Wars, because now it hasn't mm-hmm. changed from the original yeah. print. So if you happen to see Star Wars before 1995 or so, mm-hmm. you saw a version of Star Wars that nobody else, you know, younger will ever view again. Mm-hmm. And that happened to me too with um, Highlander 2, which is not a very good movie, <laughs> The Quickening. But basically, mm-hmm. and I didn't know this until um, I saw it again many years later, but I saw the original Highlander 2 when it came out, right? Mm-hmm. And then I was looking for it and I watched um, it again uh, like a year or so ago. And I was surprised because it was not the same movie that I had seen. There were, there were things that were different about it and mm-hmm. the way it was cut and plot elements. 
And I discovered that the director had done basically a director's cut. And that was the only thing that he could watch nowadays. And the first version that I saw was not available. So essentially, like Highlander 2 exists in my mind now and doesn't <laughs> in the mind of others who saw it. And yeah. and the other and the other, you know, nobody can see it like I saw it. And that also happens with music sometimes. I, you know, there was this song that um uh me and a few others, because I, I get interested in things like that, have been looking for a really long time because it was a demo tape song. Mm-hmm. So when you're recording music, sometimes the things you do on the demo don't end up in the final cut of a record. And mm-hmm. when we haven't been able to find it, none of us have been able, like people have been looking for this demo song for a really long time and we have not been able to find it. Um, only like a, a segment of it is what we've been able to basically find. And it's just, you know, it's really strange for some people listening, thinking like, why are you thinking about that? But it's the kind of thing that people who are really into this, that circles inside your your head, like what if one day they find the Democrat of, such and such song and we can listen to it right (laughs) and if you just found it if you found the physical tape because these were back in back in the day these were tapes that were made for distribution for uh, radio stations promotion and that kind of stuff so that's the kind of technology that we're looking for Uh, like you said if if a random person runs into this precious demo tape and they think it's just garbage from a different time period because they don't have the right technology to reproduce it you know, we may lose, you know, this song and, mm-hmm. and it might be in somebody's drawer right now and they just don't know it. They don't know what they have because they can't play it. And that's kind of a, a perfect segue for my question to you about obsession, because Montserrat in, in your book is is an obsessive character, not just with her interests, but with this with this quest that she embarks on. And I find that there's... um a particular brand of obsessiveness that a lot of film fans and especially horror film fans have. And I was wondering, why do you think horror in particular has this effect on people? It probably comes from the fact that it's one of the lesser, considered one of the lesser genres. Mm -hmm. So it exists or has existed for a really long time at the fringes of respectability and uh, taste in a way. And so I think that creates, um, even though it's not a respectable, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. uh, genre for many people for for a really long time, especially in certain time periods. I think now we have words like elevated horror and and things like that. But Mm -hmm. but in the 1980s, if you're talking about horror, you know, people are thinking slasher films and they're thinking you want to you want to kill somebody. Right. That 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 was the impression that I, I remember people had of me when I was, you know young in that kind of time period it was like why are you interested in this stuff you're kind of creepy sort of sort of situation but that also gives you um a certain sense of pride and there's a certain type of kind of outsider sort of personality that really derives a kind of joy in that and like i'm not part of the cool kid crowd i'm part of the out kid crowd and uh Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is kind of cool in its own way. And you find the other outsiders who exist in that in that same uh, kind of space. And um, and yeah, there's a lot of memorabilia collecting and uh, all that kind of stuff that that uh, that happens in in horror circles. I'm sure it happened. I've seen it happen also in sci fi and fantasy, but. But to a certain extent, horror still remains very much fringy in in some ways. At least, you know, I I went to Comic Con this year, and there was a lot of stuff about superheroes and the big Star Wars franchises and all that kind of stuff. There weren't that many booths that catered to kind of horror aficionados, and you would normally think that it's part of pop culture landscape, but it really isn't in the same kind of way as other as other kind of things to this day so there there's like i think a certain kind of joy of outsider art in that in mm-hmm. that pursuit and i wanted to uh, this is this isn't actually about silver nitrate but one of the um, 
the the next book of yours that I'm uh, I'll admit I haven't read yet, but it's it's on my it's on my TBR shelf. But I'm very intrigued by your rewriting of uh, Doctor Moreau, the the in the novel The Daughter of Doctor Moreau, and you've also edited collections of stories inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, and that's obviously like a quite a big influence on on your work. Can you tell me a little bit about your interest in retelling stories by um these classic science fiction or horror authors but in a in a contemporary more modernized way um i don't think it's a you know a specific interest in in retelling something because um retelling implies that you're kind of grabbing the material and telling the same thing again Mm -hmm. and the daughter of dr moreau is is very loosely inspired by the island of Dr. Moreau. If you're looking for the same characters and the same plot line and the same um, kind of um, progression of the story and kind of science fiction that Wells is deploying, you're not going to find it in The Daughter of Dr. Moreau. But what The Daughter of Dr. Moreau is doing, it's, it's taking a couple of the key ideas that uh wealth is talking about one of them is religion the other one to me has to do um with uh the ethics of um uh, engaging in, in certain kinds of behavior and and looking at and and looking at them with with a different lens but i think when people think retelling they think Oh, it's Snow White, but it's set in, I don't know, uh, in in Hollywood maybe in nowadays, and that and that is not exactly what I'm doing. If I I've never written something that you could say that is like a duplicate mm-hmm. of something else that happened before, and mm-hmm. even with yeah. even though I mentioned the work of M.R. James and it opens Silver Nitrate, the language of M.R. James, um, kind of the the types of uh, things that he does are not exactly what I'm doing in Silver Nitrate. But M.R. James said that the two most valuable ingredients of a ghost story to him were the atmosphere and the nicely managed crescendo. So M.R. James said that you have to introduce the actors of a ghost story in a very calm, placid way, going about their business, undisturbed, happy with their surroundings, and then you let the ominous thing poke out its head unobtrusively at first until it holds the stage. And that's what I'm doing with Silver Nitrate. And in Silver Nitrate, it's actually structured in three parts. In the first part, the first 30% or 25% of the novel. It's just these two friends who work in film Mm -hmm. in in Mexico City. And there's nothing supernatural. There's nothing strange going on. It's a very, you know, ordinary environment, like Emma James said. But Emma James said, you have to do that in the beginning so that the supernatural eventually pokes its head. And that what I'm doing in Silver Nitrate, but if you read an M.R. James story and you like it for its Victorianism, basically, um, the kind of uh, very gentlemanly scholar that is a lot into maps, you might be jarred when you're suddenly in Mexico City and it's in the 1990s and there's these two people who work in film and, um, and it's a woman who's one of the point of views and there's two point of views. But some of the thoughts that I had when I was reading M.R. James are in Silver Nitrate, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it completely does. And before I let you go, Sylvia, uh, is there anything that you'd like readers to take away from Silver Nitrate? Um, I mean, I, I just hope they uh, they have a good time. It's it's a lot about film, and but it's also, like I said, it's it's playing with this idea or notion of of the ghost story what is the ghost story how does the ghost story operate but ultimately it is really 
a story about two best friends and their relationship. Um, Sylvia, thank you so much for your time and for Silver Nitrate. I absolutely devoured it when I read it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. 